What's up, my healthy friends? Here we are on the Nutrition Wizards podcast. Not really. I'm just in the company of a nutrition wizard, which is good for me and good for you. Now, in 2024, it's my mission to coach 500 people to get control of their sugar cravings and sugar binges so they can stop yo-yo dieting, stop obsessing about food, and finally create a body that they feel confident being in. And if that rings a bell for you or resonates with you in any way, scroll to the show notes below, click some links, and let's have a chat. Now, back to the wizard who appeared on episode 167, 198, 206, 265, and now this one, we've got fellow Aussie Marty Kendall here on the podcast Airwaves. Marty is an engineer who seeks to optimize nutrition using a data-driven approach. His interest in nutrition began 18 years ago in an effort to help his wife, Monica, gain better control of her type 1 diabetes, but since then has created an epic data-driven organization called Optimizing Nutrition and has also developed Nutrient Optimizer and Data-Driven driven Fasting, which I know many of our listeners and many of my clients as well have actually done before. So, Marty, what's going on? Welcome back. You're hilarious, dude. Great to be back. Have we talked that many times? I knew you were good friends, but that's crazy. Yeah, I think you might be... This might be the most amount of time someone's been back on the podcast. Oh, well, what an honor. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> People just keep listening, hoping to hear you again, basically. <laughs> <laughs> the Marty and Maddie show. Hey, that's got a good ring to it. And many people, whenever they send me a text message, since the day of predictive text, they incorrectly, call Maddie. Marty. I get Marty all the time, all the time. <laughs> and there's a part of me that goes, oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm blushing. Anyway, what's up, <laughs> hey, man? What, what, what are we going to talk about? Oh, there's so much juicy stuff to talk about, especially with you ruffling some uh, feathers of some big dogs in the industry with your wizardry. <laughs> wizardry, yeah. I was just data man, so anyway. Well, let's start there. What What is nutrition? Just data, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just fascinated by the idea that nutrition is about nutrients. And as an engineer, I want to quantify that and understand it because I've just, you know, you mentioned my wife, Monica, but way before that, started out in a seventh Adventist environment and it's like the epicenter of nutritional dogma and belief and then every nutritional movement I sort of touch and experience, you just see the same dogma and belief, whether it be ethics or religion or just, you know, everybody moves on from religion in their own in their own little cult bubble named <laughs> diet. And, you know, if you're not part of that club you're not a true believer and you're wrong. And it's just like, surely, you know, we're, we're so, such an adaptive species that survived in so many different environments. What are the key things? What are the quantifiable things that work for everybody all the time? What are the key factors? And that's what I'm obsessed with quantifying and understanding with the data. I had a conversation with a friend recently who's got Sri Lankan Indian background. Yeah. And we were talking about this idea of – um variety in the diet mm. and she said she was saying that's such a new that's such a western concept because she's like we grew up with the same curries and the same rice every meal every day and then i, I know people in like the caribbean rice and beans you know they've been doing you know doing that yeah. every meal every day for so long and then it's this sort of really modern western idea that we need variety like yeah. you know and, and that i think plays into this idea of trends diet trends and diet ideology a little bit or at the same time, we need to be able to get our fruit and our you know, meat and everything all on the same day from anywhere all over the world. So it's you know, winter here, but let's order fruit from wherever. And uh, we've got this diet that is no longer influenced by the seasons. And, and it, like you mentioned, if you're in Sri Lanka or India or Thailand or you know, Iceland, you'd have a completely different diet and it would change with the seasons. And we were fine then. Because you'd get yeah. more carbs, carbs in summer and more fat in winter and it would be this perfect cycle that you'd never have this magical combination of fat and carbs. But the, you know, the, what the data shows is that we've engineered our way into a hyper-palatable, dopamine-overdriving, hyper-profitable dietary system that we just can't stop eating and you know big food just goes this is the formula we hit the bliss point for every nutrient and they buy more and we make more money and then we can sell them <laughs> drugs and you know it's, it's just this monetized system of food and yeah it, it wasn't like that 100 years ago where do you think that ends 
Because obviously societies oh, end up so obese for so long. <laughs> At I some point, care. we all disintegrate into nothing. Well, fertility starting to drop. I, w- I was worried a few years ago that you know the the food system we'd created was creating this population growth. And you look at back in the fifties, sixties when we started to inject fossil fuel fertilizers to create all this extra energy from refined grains and vegetable oil, sea oils in the food system, and that enabled this population explosion like never before. But now we've we've made ourselves so fat and metabolically unfit that we're becoming infertile. And, you know, we're also addicted to our phones and couldn't be asked getting off and talking to a real person of the opposite sex to have any chance <laughs> of procreating. But, you know, I don't know. We'll if you we, we always get philosophical and get in these deep rabbit holes, but you know, we'll so work itself <laughs> out and, and and we'll make ourselves so infertile before so long that uh, you know, that the human species won't be a threat anymore. Yeah. Well on the other side of that coin is whilst uh, fertility is dropping, IVF is skyrocketing. You know, people that might have otherwise been able to procreate in a healthy body, mm. you know, trying to get two unhealthy mm. bodies together. Nature generally sort of says yeah. it's probably a bad idea for the offspring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that nature's smart. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, so I'm curious to go down this satiety craving conversation. We talked about yeah. it a little bit before and it's a big part of the message you've been sharing for a long mm. time now. Um, let's maybe just introduce people to to what that concept is, the craving versus satiety conversation. Yeah, no, it's just something I've been fascinated even more by lately. And as I've dug into the data, I got, you know, a million days of data on macronutrients and 620,000 days on micronutrients. And I kept seeing this pattern, like when you think of protein, we crave to get enough protein if we're on a very low protein diet will crave protein to get us to 12%, 12.5% protein. And then we try to chow down a more, you know, lean beef or chicken or, or whatever. And we just go, no, I'm just so full. Mm-hmm. And then that's you know, there's always room for dessert. So you're gonna go for the the dessert, there'll always be room for it because you've tapped out your capacity for the protein and now you want to balance it with energy from carbs and fat. And you see the same pattern with sodium and calcium and potassium and carbs and fat have this magical little thing where they come together in the middle that's not carbs fat carbs bad fat bad it's the combo of both that never happens in nature that other than in autumn that drives us wild and we keep on eating it so yeah it just sort of dawned on me that you know the data shows that we always gravitate back to this bliss point this point of optimal concentration of each and every nutrient that aligns with maximum intake Um, and the solution is not to be malnourished by going under that but to nudge ourselves a little bit over that concentration so for for protein rather than 12 percent protein go for 15 20 25 30 percent protein for sodium for potassium get a little bit more a higher concentration in your diet and you're well nourished, you're satiated, and and all that for the food noise and the cravings that we're trying to shut off artificially with blockbuster expensive GLP one drugs these days. You know, it goes away. So, and by GLP one drugs, are you are uh, referring to like the very yeah. popular Ozempic yeah, and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's huge, and nobody's talking about the role that nutrients play in the food noise that everybody talks about. And really, that's the that's the solution. If we all went back to foods that give us the nourishment, the nutrients we need, we probably wouldn't need them at all. Maybe some people who you know have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble need that, and a nutrient dense, high satiety diet is going to help them in that process. But what happens if you artificially turn off your cravings for five, ten, fifteen, twenty years? How malnourished are you if you went from eating one large family pizza a day to a quarter of a large family pizza a day? What nutrients are you getting at that point? You know, that that's that, I think that's scary. And, you know, I don't think anybody's looking at that because they don't want to know. But what happens to the do we just become diabolically malnourished and all the long term, um, you know, uh, longevity functions of our body just shut down because they're so dependent on 
all the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that come with real food. I think there's an, from what you just said, an idea in what you just said that might not be super obvious to everybody, but this idea that cravings and appetite is connected to a new nutritional requirement in the body. Mm, is that correct? Totally. Am I picking yeah, that yeah. up? I mean, you need a certain amount of protein to maintain your muscle. If you don't get the protein, you suck a penny and you waste away, but you also need a certain amount of sodium and potassium and calcium and vitamin B2 and all these things, they, they, you know, the numbers come together and it's just beautiful. And that's what I've been so excited about recently is trying to work out you know, how much of a factor is energy density versus protein versus potassium and calcium. And it's like the list of 12 different factors calibrated to get the perfect satiety score that is better than anything else that's ever been done. I mean, the University of Sydney did the um, satiety index back in 1995 and nobody's really touched the concept of satiety since then to quantify it. I think it's probably the most important thing of how we can nourish our bodies and crush our cravings by giving the body our bodies the nutrients they're actually craving. It's like, but hey, Marty, you. if you make people feel full, <laughs> they won't buy food. <laughs> I know, right? And now Nestle is coming out with you know a higher protein, nutrient dense, ready made meals for people on Ozempic, and it's like, well, what if we just fed them that in the first place rather than yeah. this other crap? <laughs> Just get rid of the Ozempic and do the same thing. Yeah. What, what, what if we just ate real food that, you know, meat, seafood, veggies, dairy, you know, you'd, you'd shut down your appetites and you'd be happy and you wouldn't have that food noise that we're all so addicted to food apparently. But, you know, what are we addicted to? It's the donuts and croissants and all nuts and it's those magic foods that are perfect that only really occur in autumn that prepare us for winter. But now we've just created a food system that gives it to us 24-7-365. What, what kind of foods appear in autumn and why autumn that, that have that kind of magical yeah, combination? I mean, I look at it from a circannual perspective that, you know, as I mentioned, summer's got more carbs, winter's got more protein and fat. Um, spring is more of a, you know, protein spare modified fast protein and, and young fiber and then autumn you get this combination of fat and carbs with the nuts and the fruit and the you know you get the fatty meat at the same time and you know you see a, a bear about to go into hibernation there's something about the environment and the food in that environment that just enables them to gain so much fat so they can survive winter and we've we're on the same program but we've programmed our food system to tell us that winter's coming all the time and we just keep on eating those foods because they're just so profitable. I'm curious with this, the craving satiety idea, yep. is that even though those foods are available outside of autumn, if we hit satiety, should we not be, we shouldn't crave them, even irrelevant mm. of their availability, right? Yeah, if, if you get the all the nutrients your body needs, your appetite switches off, you develop sensory specific satiety so even with sugar if you add too much sugar to your tea it's going to be like oh that's too sweet i won't drink as much of that thank you very much mm -hmm. if you just you know sat in a corner with a bag of sugar or a bag of flour or you know three liters of canola oil are you going to binge on that you don't see the kids out the front of kmart drinking gobs of you know binging on <laughs> yeah. the on the canola or ld you know oh, not the, with the pure flour or pure sugar it, it's the combination of the fat and carbs together um with artificial flavors colorings and even the fortified vitamins just seem to perfectly hit that bliss point for all the vitamins and iron and if you didn't add those i think our body would go yeah i don't don't like it it's just not quite right thank you very much i'll you know I might get some steak and chicken and seafood and salmon uh, instead, but in like the, the the cocoa bolts are fortified with iron and B12 and B2, and we just go, oh, that's just right. I'll keep on chowing down. Yeah. <laughs> you've probably seen this with people you've worked with too, but I've seen that when people go through an extended period of, of hitting satiation, getting the right nutrients, increasing their protein, managing their blood sugar, they go sometimes they go back to some of those foods because they mm. want to, they miss the taste or they miss the experience, and they're like, "Maddie, like I don't crap. even like, yeah, I don't even like the chocolate that I used to love. Like, what have you done to me? <laughs> what have you done to me? You've broken my, 
<laughs> broken my appetite. Yeah, and they're no longer as seductive. You know, the, yeah. these. And that's the thing about the Bliss Point foods. Howie Moskowitz back in the nineteen sixties, genius um, quantitative analysis, developed. You know a whole bunch of pastas and Dr. Pepper and all, using surveys to find the perfect amount of fat, salt, sugar that people wanted to keep eating. And, you know, uh, and that was 50 years ago, man. And the, the processed food industry is built on that technology that every recipe that you see that's got a label in the center aisles of the supermarket is optimized to hit all those bliss points so you'll buy more so anything with a barcode and a list of ingredients that contains you know refined flour vegetable oils flavors colors a bit of sugar whatever it's probably not sugar anymore because they can flavor the fat um it's designed to hit your bliss point and it, 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 it's not going to satisfy do you think because of all this you know frankenstein food franken food um <laughs> that's in our diet, do you think we've developed cravings that are like for things that are not reflective of what's in nature and that's part of the problem? Yeah. Like the one big mind blow recently is like, as I said to you, we don't crave empty calories and we're satiated by really nutrient dense foods and like the Big Mac and the pizza aren't nutrient poor but they're not nutrient rich they're right in the middle they mm. give us just the right amount of blend of nutrients and energy that aligns with maximum intake so we want to keep coming back to that food like if you have a big mac or a coke it, it, it's tasty but not offensive there's no overpowering flavors in in the big mac it's just like yeah it's okay I can have another two. I'm not really satisfied, but it wasn't offensive. If there was, if it was too salty, or it's just got the right amount, the right blend of nutrients that keeps us yeah. coming back again and again and again. And and the foods that hit more of the bliss points are the are the blockbuster. You know, you look at it, the subway cookie ranks with a zero, and trail mix has got a zero satiety score, and the Big Mac has got a yeah, satiety wow. score of four, and you know, the, the vegetarian pizza has got a satiety score of zero. And it's like, oh, yeah, they're all the, you know, we measure economies with the price of Big Macs because they've sold, I don't know, 300 billion of them or some crazy oh amount that, of Big Macs. That is Macs. crazy. <laughs> and McDonald's know what they're doing. They optimize exactly, you know, and your, your sweet chocolate isn't quite, you can't eat as much of that in the day as, as you can the pizza or the Big Mac. The Big Mac is sort of designed to be eaten all day, every day, and nothing else. But the dessert, the the ice cream, the sweet food sort of that we sort of feel addicted to that give us a bigger short-term dopamine hit is sort of perfect once you've had your steak and veggies and go, I'll just round it out and get the rest of my energy from from the, the the dessert food but yeah it's those pizzas the big mac those sort of things that are perfectly balanced that we can eat all day every day forever and maximize how much we'll buy and how much we'll eat and how much fat we'll store that's something sweet that people crave after the meal is yeah. that a habit a habitual response because maybe they grew up with dessert or ice cream or whatever as kids and they're just used to that cycle of events biologically or is it the continued um, seeking of, of fulfillment from nutrition or satiation from nutrition? Uh, I think we're just trying to balance the, the fat and carbs and protein and nutrients to get us to the, the bliss point because there's a, a bliss point for sugar. You don't get addicted to apples or bananas. You get addicted to things that have sugar and fat together and sugar's got a 19% bliss point. So if you're food has 19% of the calories from sugar. It's the perfect amount to maximize energy intake. If it's zero sugar, you go, yeah, I'm not that interested. I mm -hmm. won't overeat your steak or your you know, dairy, um, which has got low sugar. But if you've got fruit or really high sugar foods, you're not going to overeat those because you've filled up your, your glucose stores in your body and – you can think, hey, I've got 2,000 calories worth of glucose to fill a lot of fat and I can only eat so much protein before my muscles tap out and I can't eat more and my body says, hey, that protein's not a great fuel source. Can we stop with the protein and 
go back to filling up our, our glucose and fat stores. So you can think our body is always trying to solve that equation of balancing fat, carbs, and protein along with all the uh, minerals and vitamins. So, yeah, I just think, and given the opportunity, we, we want to maximize storage for winter because if those foods are around, winter must be coming. Yeah, it seems like winter's always coming. It never, yeah, it's like <laughs> like Game of Thrones. Winter's always coming, but it never actually comes. We never actually get to a point where there's there's no fat and carbs together, and we have to go into a, a low carb food environment. But then, yeah, uh, uh, but then we get stuck in a low carb camp, and we never get out of that. Into maybe we need to get our carbs down and go into the low carb keto, but then we love the fat and we fall in love with the fat and never get into the protein spray modified fast spring and, and we never dare venture to summer which has got the the high carbs and the and the lower fat. So but whichever quadrant you're in, you're okay as long as you don't stay there forever. Eat seasonal local natural foods is probably a, a fairly good guideline. Yeah, I mean, there's about four places I want to take this conversation. But while we're on the, because you've said low carb, we have to do three more episodes, man. <laughs> oh my god, it will be the Marty and Maddie show. <laughs> but the like the low carb thing, like what 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 are the consequences blood from a blood sugar standpoint, or a diet standpoint, or a satiety standpoint from staying long term low carb and keeping your blood sugar low? Uh, I'm a massive fan of low carb, lower mm-hmm. carb. Um, you get plenty of protein and you know you get out of that carb plus fat the the bliss point for carbs is about fifty percent forty eight percent carbs with the rest mm-hmm. from fat and a bit of protein so that's the the maximum hyper palatable formula that every processed food hits yeah and if you get your carbs from fifty percent to twenty percent you get a massive satiety boost, but that's also because you tend to increase your protein. Um, I suppose then you get into people go, well, it was the carbs and, you know, fat doesn't raise insulin at all. Therefore, fat good, protein raises insulin a bit, so we're going to avoid that and we're just going to go zero carb and believe fat as a free food and just keep on chowing down on that and we can sweeten that and make fat bombs and geez these are tasty and <laughs> oh, my fat loss stalled what the hell happened there i thought i was i turned off my pancreas ah so there's a plateau there's a stunt yeah, in, yeah, yeah stunt especially when you believe that fat is a free food that you can eat in almost unlimited quantities which you know if you're chasing ketones and Believe the carb insulin hypothesis, then that's a, a natural conclusion for a lot of people because we just fall in love with food. We're addicted to, we use food for comfort and soothe our, soothe our little stresses and get a dopamine boost. And yeah, uh, I'm curious to go more into that that idea of the the plateau. Like what? Because you know that plagues so many people that mm. try to lose weight is that yeah. dreaded plateau. How soon is it going to come? How long am I stuck here? So, so what, what's, what what's going on there? Uh, people, people tend to increase their fat when they drop their carbs. So if you drop your carbs, good, you've, you've got out of that danger zone. But if you keep on dropping your carbs, you know, 20% is great. You're not going to get a lot of satiety benefit from going from 20 to zero. And once you go from 20 to zero, you're cutting out all vegetables, all low energy density foods, and maybe you're, you're, you're cutting back protein for some reason because you heard it was bad for longevity. Or you know, we we don't overeat protein. We can't overeat protein. Our body goes, no, nah, I, I I can't do anything with that. So there's like a hard limit for protein. So if you dial up the protein percentage, um, by dialing back your fat and carbs while prioritizing protein, you just that's the satiety magic. It's not only carbs, it's carbs and fat. And carbs is the short-term insulin glucose response and fat. It gets stored on your body and you need insulin to keep that energy from fat stored on your body. So the bigger you are, the more fat you have, the more insulin you need to hold that in storage. And what gets me angry is that... A lot of people just focus on that short-term insulin response. They go, look, we studied the insulin response to food over two hours and look, 
carbs has got the biggest insulin response and that's because the body says well, we've got no room to store all this carbohydrate all this glucose in our body we've only got our muscles are full our, our blood is full so we're going to raise insulin to shut the release of energy from our body so everything gets held back until we use up the excess sugar in our body and then insulin drops but what happens when you eat the fat it just goes the body goes oh cool we've got heaps of storage for that in the back just you know rock on down back of the bus and mm -hmm. all that fat gets stored and then the bigger you get the more insulin resistant you get the more insulin you need to hold all that extra energy in storage and you never turn off your pancreas regardless of how low your carbs are and how high, how high your ketones are because unless you're an uncontrolled type 1 diabetic um, who intentionally underdoses insulin, that's called diabolemia, it's really dangerous and you die, you're always going to have enough insulin to store the fat you eat on your body. If you didn't, that, that would be evolutionarily stupid. <laughs> and uh, I'm of the belief nature doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your pancreas is very smart and knows exactly how much insulin you need. If you got... Someone jabbing you in the bum with insulin, an insulin needle round the clock, your, your blood sugars are going to crash, you're going to get hungry, you're going to eat more. But the, the endogenous insulin that your pancreas produces is the perfect amount for the amount of food you're eating. So the way to manipulate how much you're eating is to prioritize higher satiety foods, which are more nutritious, nutrient-dense foods. Yeah. I'm a big fan of low carb as well and a lot of the people I work with move in that direction and I myself am very much mostly in that direction. But I'm wondering, do you see or do you, do you know um, what happens when people get like carbohydrate resistant? Have you seen that? When people go extremely keto, extremely carnivore, extremely low carb and then mm. they have a carb and it basically wipes them out. Like they're just absolutely energy depleted. Mm. Like it's almost like they don't, their body has forgotten how to manage the blood sugar. Yeah, yeah. You, you, your pancreas is having a happy little rest in the back and going, yeah, I only need this much insulin. So there's not a – your pancreas isn't on go mode all the time. So once you have a big carb bolus, your pancreas, pancreas goes, oh, wait, I have to wake up and remember how to produce all this insulin. So it just takes a while to adapt. And if you went back from a low-carb diet to a very high-carb diet, your pancreas would adapt after a few days. But yeah, yeah it's, you definitely feel like crap. A lot of people will see really bad blood sugars and go, look, I, I, I ate an apple and my blood sugars rose by whatever and therefore, yeah. But It's, it's like the, the other side of the keto flu coin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not the end of the world. But And, and people on a lower carb diet might see higher waking glucose and that's, that's sort of perfectly fine. As we mentioned before, mm -hmm. we started talking – Low-carb people tend to wake up with a higher waking glucose and the glucose drops during the day and vice versa for people on a low-fat diet. The glucose in the morning will be lower and they'll top up their glucose fuel tank during the day. So, yeah, for people on a low-carb diet, starting the day with a solid bolus of protein and then saving any carbs for later in the day is a smart idea. Yeah, yeah. Further to this conversation, I guess, on the – Low carb, sugar, insulin, and you mentioned before the you know the insulin sugar carb hypothesis. It's been a big thing, obviously, for the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years, mm. and and then intermittent fasting has sort of been the the biggest social response to that. The like yep. this is the movement of it, or the dietary response to that, and then add in keto and all of those other things. Mm. But they're all off the back of this insulin hypothesis, mm. insulin sugar carb hypothesis. Mm. I'm curious because you've ruffled some feathers in this world um, of famous people that sort of back this idea. What did they get wrong about the carb, insulin, sugar, blood sugar hypothesis? Uh, a, they only consider the short-term impact of insulin due to carbs, which is higher over the first two hours. There's a longer-term insulin response to the food we eat due to fat and protein. So protein might be five to seven hours, fat might be eight to 12 hours, but to be honest, we haven't measured it other than people injecting insulin and tracking their CGMs, type 1 diabetics, see that they need insulin over the longer term for a high-fat meal. And if you dial back fat, 
you need less insulin and your blood sugars drop earlier. And we see that all the time in the data-driven fasting challenges. But but the second part of that, as I mentioned before, once you get more fat stored in your body, you need more insulin to hold that in storage. So they're only considering the the bolus um, insulin in response to carbohydrates, not the longer term response to fat, which nobody's quantified. I wish somebody would. Um, you just need a massive study with a whole bunch of type 1 diabetics tracking everything they eat. And I think that would be great because type 1 community really need that. And I've talked to a bunch of people lately after I got a bit angry about it and wrote an article and they're going, yeah, we need this. We need to understand how much insulin we need to dose for protein and fat over the long term because the current algorithms are crap and nobody's looking at it. And then nobody sees the basal insulin, and and you might wake up with a, you know, somebody who's on a low carb diet. Seventy to eighty percent of their daily insulin is the basal insulin that they need, regardless of whether they eat or not. So my wife just to, get, just to hold their body together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they might wake up with a a fasting insulin of twenty five. They're a bit obese, insulin resistant. They avoid all the carbs, they eat fat, and they've still got that fasting insulin of 25 across the whole day. So their pancreas is still working overtime. Yeah. And and once you've dialed back the carbs in your diet, step two is to go, well, how do I dial back the, the fat in my body? And do I eat more fat or less fat? I don't know. It, it, if, if you're trying to get your ketones higher – which was the thing from 10 years ago, just eat more fat. It's a free food. If you've got your ketones high, your insulin will be low. But it just doesn't work that way. And a lot of people, like type 1s, I know, they they chasing elevated ketones. They just needed more and more insulin. They got fatter and fatter. And they said the, it was like injecting water. And they needed three times as much insulin every day because they gained oh, wow. so much fat because they became so insulin resistant. And once the the fat cells fill up and reach capacity. You just need more and more insulin to hold that fat in storage. And what's the solution? It's like, well, stop eating quite so much fat. Get your protein without you, – you dial back the carbs, now dial back the fat. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so so just making sense of it for myself. So it's like the idea that if you've got a lot of body fat, your ba- basal insulin level will be high because that insulin has not just the job of storing dietary sugar, but keeping the fat stores in storage and your whole body not falling apart. So that's the totally. why that insulin is high to begin with. Totally, totally. So 80% of, like, uh, for someone on a standard Western diet, it's sort of a 50 50 basal bolus split, but mm-hmm. someone on a low carb diet, it's like a 20 bolus, 80% basal split. So the major- vast majority of their insulin that the pancreas is pumping out is just to hold the body together and, you know, some degree the, the, the insulin response to the fat in their food that we just don't measure because it's over a long period of time. So, yeah, the n- next step is to, you know, how do I increase satiety and that reduces insulin and the first macros masterclass we ran, the wife and I both did it and her daily insulin went from like 35 units to 13 units a day. Wow. You know, she was on a maintenance low-carb diet, then prioritized protein, dialed back the fat and the daily insulin, you know, was a third. I was like, this is yeah. freaky. <laughs> but yeah. you, you, I believe the data. You know, you, know, you know, that's what I live. That's what I what I see every day. But most people don't have the luxury of seeing continuous closed loop insulin pump systems on their screen. Yeah, it's the the pinnacle of romance for most couples. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's my Tamagotchi. Got to keep <laughs> my mission is to keep her that's alive. Such a, that's such a funny comparison. <laughs> <laughs> my eighteen-year-old son doesn't want to be a Tamagotchi quite as much, but uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it it didn't harm him. He he, uh, you know, set a world record deadlift a year I after saw he that. got type one diabetes. So yeah, it it just insulin, protein, get big, get strong. Yeah. Growth hormone, growth hormone, and testosterone of a seventeen-year-old. 
Oh, you must be so proud. Like, you yeah, know, to run I'm a- jealous, but proud, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we all wish we were the man we used to be. <laughs> <laughs> living living vicariously through the 18-year-old son. <laughs> oh, um, I was going to say, the, the thing, because you just said, like, you know, you, not many people get access to this level of data. Um, and so the thing that I find is the biggest resistance to maybe an approach like this is the amount of tracking and the amount of data collection people have to do and that they just get fed up with one making their dinner and yep. algebra equation. Um, um, and because that's just, you know, people enjoy food. They don't want to yep. associate yep. it with that. And they've been on so many calorie counting diets. They're like, yep. data collection doesn't work. So yeah. my my thing is, how do we make it practical for people so yeah. that they have to do less tracking and more eating and enjoying? Yeah, um, prioritize protein and, and yeah, go low carb, but... If you're if you're not losing weight and you want to lose weight, then you know look at where is my fat coming from? Am I adding a truckload of dressings? And is everything I eat luxuriously high fat? I'm gonna, am I getting the highest fat bacon and the highest fat steak? And maybe I could dial that back and instead of the the full fat Greek yogurt, go for the high protein, low fat Greek yogurt or low fat cottage cheese or you know even egg whites with one whole egg just doesn't really taste any different. All those little hacks that tweak it. But um, yeah, it's amazing how many people in our programs have gone through you know, keto and low carb and extended fasting, intermittent fasting and everything, especially the older females who, you know, when they hit menopause, it becomes quite dramatic due to the changes in hormones that they yeah. they use, they struggle to hold on to the muscle mass and then the body senses that and says we need more protein to keep our muscles so we eat more if we keep on eating the same low protein low protein percentage stuff that we ate before we just they just keep on gaining weight so that bit of tracking at that point we tend to attract the people who have tried everything else and then they get into our programs and go, wow, I track my food and I can't believe how much fat I was eating and now I'm so full. We, we just take what they're currently eating and say, we're not trying to limit calories. We're trying to optimize your diet to maximize, to, not maximize, but to increase satiety and increase nutrient density. We're not tracking to restrict we're tracking so we can make sure we nourish our bodies and give them exactly what they need precisely and then they go oh so much food i can't eat it all and i'm you know so few calories i'm so full and wow look i'm losing weight this is the the only thing that's ever worked yeah you said in there something which i've the first person i've heard say in a long time you said get the low fat option but isn't one of the problems in the supermarket that low fat products have got (laughs) sugar replacements Yeah. not the low fat high protein Greek yogurt or okay, you know, okay. get the get the and, and that's where a bit of tracking to learn what your food actually contains. Yeah. Yeah, right. There was a big low fat craze and the food manufacturers just went, Yeah, we're gonna you know, protein's expensive because we so we can't make it high protein. So we're gonna swap yeah. the fat for sugar and high fructose corn syrup and then Atkins came along and everybody tried to go low carb and then Artificial sweeteners got approved and went, oh, huzzah, we can no longer, we no longer need to use high fructose corn syrup. We can sweeten the vegetable oils and, you know, we, we go again. And vegetable oils have just skyrocketed since then as this empty calorie input to our food system that's super cheap. We can flavor it to be anything we want mm-hmm. and um, make a lot more money. And I, I think it's probably. In terms of dietary thermogenesis, dietary induced thermogenesis, the the fat probably gets absorbed into our body even easier than the sugar and the high fructose corn syrup. It, it just the body just goes, yeah, we got heaps of room for the fat. We don't even have to process it to turn it into fat through um, what is it, lipogenesis. Yeah. Um, curious as you were talking about the manufacturers identifying protein as expensive. Do you yeah. think uh, that's a part of the whole fast food industry moving to plant-based burgers and yeah, stuff like it's that? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. Yeah, money saving, right? <laughs> it's cheaper. Cow- cows and dairy are expensive and that that dairy needs to be refrigerated. But if you make an ice cream with fake foods and engineer it, you can ship it across the country. The um 
Ultra Process People is a fascinating read, and also um, I've, I've loved Michael Moss's Fat Sugar, um, Sugar Fat Salt, um, just tells the history of the the processed food industry and how they took Howie Moskowitz's engineering technology to make you know Philip Morris bought General Foods and Kraft and just turned them into the same addictive foods that. They, when they saw that the cigarettes were on the down and not going to make money there, so we're going to use the same you know, addictive. I'm not sure I agree food is addictive. It's a debatable topic but because um, we need to eat and it doesn't produce as much dopamine as cocaine. There's a little dopamine response, but um, that's a whole other topic. But, yeah, but the, mm-hmm. they've just optimized their food for profit. That's it. It's just money. It's not a conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a few. Um, is it Chris Van Tol- yeah. Tolken? Yeah, Tolken? yeah, yeah. Ultra yeah. Process people could read. Yeah, it's a great read. It's a great read. A lot, lot of people loved it. What, what's that? A lot oh, of it's been incredibly popular, especially in the UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I saw him on um, Diary of a CEO, um, and I'm yeah, not sure where great. I fall in that conversation because. He's gone aw- totally away from personal empowerment and, you know, the system needs to change. But I feel like the system doesn't change unless we spend our dollars somewhere else. The only language they talk is economics, right? So it's yeah. like we need a bit of personal empowerment, yeah. empowerment to put our money in the right place to push the industry to whole real food. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not fully on board with the processed food being the only demon because we can create ultra hyper palatable fat carb combos grandmas have been doing it for christmas mm. for centuries and and we know how to buy nuts and seeds and cheese and all these things that if we combine them in just the right way they, they give the same um dopamine overdriving fat carb response so i think the label of processed food is fraught with issues and that's why i've been so passionate to quantify what are the quantifiable parameters in a food that align with overeating so we can have a better, like the satiety index, if, if you know, my dream would be that, um, you know, there'd be a cigarette tax-like thing on foods that were optimized for maximum profit and that would subsidize foods that, were, were you know more natural, more nutritious, more locally grown, and that weren't going to overdrive um, uh, the, their high satiety, high nutrient density. Imagine if the tax was determined on the satiety index. Yeah, oh, that, why do you think I've been trawling <laughs> through six hundred and twenty thousand days of data in in a spreadsheet and all different permutations trying to perfect this satiety score? I've been yeah, now you've just got obsessed. to convince the government. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I get there, but I'm just trying to educate the people that will listen and create a better blog and uh, better articles. And uh, yeah, uh, my, my dream. I've been talking to Robin Homer and Simpson a little bit about publishing the the nutrient leverage hypothesis. You know. 20 years later after the protein leverage hypothesis and their their data nerd um, Alexander uh, uh, Alistair senior sorry went through my analysis and went yeah found the same thing you're you're on the right track and we should great keep talking so you know I've got a data driven fasting paper in the works that should be published soon and nutrient leverage hypothesis co-published with Robin Hunter and Simpson, that would be, uh, you know, then I'd die happy. I'd just retired quick. Yeah, that's super <laughs> impressive. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, on that, that's probably a good good spot for us to say, where can everybody find you online? Like, where can we send everyone to get more of you? Uh, yeah. Um, just Google Marty Kendall or Optimizing Nutrition. Um, I've got a website, which I've been working hard to make it really simple. Google seems to be loving my food list. I've just been updating my high satiety foods list. So high satiety vegetables, meat, dairy, you can just dive in and go, this is popular foods. So check out the website. And we've got a community of nearly 11,000 people now, which is like creating my little sub cult of people who believe nutrition <laughs> is about nutrients. Everybody else does it. But um, yeah, it's just a really great community away from the uh, 
about the noise that's so prevalent out there and rather than everybody just debating the minutiae, they're encouraging each other and inspiring each other and sharing the results. And that's where we do our macros masterclass and micros masterclass and data-driven fasting, which, yeah, that's my life. I love it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of all of your work. I read Thanks, a lot of the stuff you send me and, um, yeah, yeah. Like I see that as kind of my own database of like, where am I at in this world? What do I think? Let's ask Marty. This is what I think. (laughs) (laughs) Marty's always got crazy ideas that are never the same as everybody else. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel a bit similar in that way. Uh, But um, but no, thanks for hanging out again. I appreciate it. I I love all of our conversations and our back and forth link sharing, idea sharing and messenger um, from time to time. But um. Yeah, but to to finish up, what is one piece of information you wish more people knew about in regards um, yeah, to health, I'm, wellness, all this stuff? I'm still trying to start a rumor that nutrition is about nutrients. <laughs> Consider it successfully <laughs> <Sorry>. started. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid idea, but uh, yeah. I might tell some people today. I might whisper <laughs> to some people at the supermarket. Yeah. And see how many people call the cops. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. You know, it seems to be about <laughs> everything else, avoiding all the bad things in food and, you know, plants versus animals. And it just seems to be a massive distraction. Like mm. uh, somebody said, is, is, is like a, is all, you know, carnivore, plant based, low carb, keto. Is it just a psyop? from the processed food companies trying to distract us from them just cranking out hyper palatable for profit crap nutrient poor food yeah and then with every diet iteration they can just re rebrand the the, the yeah. same thing yeah. as, as yeah. according to the latest you know dietary template it's easy they just keep adapting the the bliss point formula to any dietary template to maximize yeah. profit but if people started to focus on does it contain the protein and the minerals and the nutrients I need? They'd be staffed. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Empowered people. That'd be cool, eh? Yes. That's what we're all about. How did I get sick and die with Maddie and Marty? <laughs> <laughs> I, I accept the offer to join your podcast full time, Maddie. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Welcome <laughs> to the team. <laughs> all right, man. Thanks for hanging out. We'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, dude. See ya.